Hello, I'm Alex Burton. This is The Business File. The focus of our program today is on management. At the heart of a business manager's job is managing human resources. Once an organization has hired the right people and put them in the right jobs, it's the manager's responsibility to create a positive environment for them to work in. What would that be? Well, a stable setting where each worker is appreciated, knows what's expected of him or her, and has individual goals that coincide with the goals of the company. Let me say that again. The manager has to create the work environment. It only makes sense that the environment itself will be a reflection of a manager's personal belief or philosophy of management. There are two extreme philosophies. They are called Theory X and Theory Y. The Theory X manager believes that people are basically lazy, need to be controlled, want to be told what to do at every turn. All they really are looking for is job security. On the other hand, the Theory Y manager has a positive attitude towards people. Workers are seen as intelligent and creative, ready to accept responsibility, work towards company goals. The important point is that a manager's personal philosophy influences his leadership style. A Theory X manager would keep employees out of the decision-making process. A Theory Y manager would welcome their ideas, encourage them to participate, in short, create a positive work environment. During this program, we are going to visit with three guests. In Boston, a university professor who made important contributions to the field of management, in Cupertino, California, and in Dallas, with two businessmen who have been quite successful creating positive work environments for people. Right now, two of those guests are standing by to talk with us. First is George Leibovitz, Professor of Organizational Behavior, Boston University. Professor Leibovitz, it's a pleasure to have you with us on the program today. Thank you. Our second guest is joining us from his offices in Dallas. He's Don Lawhorn, President and Board Chairman of Captronics, one of the country's fastest growing electronic firms. Don, we appreciate you taking the time to have us in your offices. How are you today? Doing fine, Alex. Thank you very much. And glad to be a part of the program. I'd like to direct my first question to Dr. Leibovitz, a very general one. Dr. Leibovitz, just how does a manager go about influencing employee performance? I point out to my students that if you really try to boil management down to what is this really all about, that ultimately a manager's job is to be an environmental creator. You know, there's a, an old formula. I'm a social psychologist by trade. One of the grand old men in social psychology, Kurt Lewin, back in the 40s, said, drew a, a formula that said behavior is a function of the individual and the environment. What you control as a boss, as a, as a supervisor, is the environment, the milieu, the atmosphere within which people work. Change the environment, and you can change behavior. Don Lawhorn in Dallas. You heard Dr. Leibovitz's comment about differences between people. Why is it important that managers treat people under them as individuals? Because they are individuals. They are unique. They come to us with different life experiences, different values, different expectations. And to attempt to generalize about all people this, all people that, uh, you run the risk that uh, if you're wrong, you could uh, create havoc within your own organization. So. They're individuals, and that's the way they should be addressed. So, uh, so you would also say that people are motivated differently and respond differently. Oh, absolutely. Uh, there may be some some general uh, thoughts about uh, backgrounds and individuals uh, being common. For example, most people are uh, interested to some degree in security, uh, but that will vary with individuals. So, so there are some some general applications, but it's to what degree that fits a particular person that the supervisor has got to, to size up to the best of his or her ability. Based on what Don just said, Dr. Leibovitz, are there some basic theories or bodies of information that will help managers understand people and work with them better? Oh, sure. One of the things that is as relevant today as it was 40 years ago uh, is Aid Maslow's hierarchy of needs. When Maslow talked about his theory of human motivation, he published his article in the, in the journal, Psychological Review, 1942, Winter Edition. He didn't publish in the Harvard Business Review. He was a psychologist writing for psychologists. 
But businessmen saw right away that they could apply what he was talking about. There are many more complex theories of motivation around that turn social psychologists on, but don't do anything for managers. So managers found a lot of relevance in Maslow. And, and as, as I'm assuming you know, when Maslow drew that pyramid and said, we go up and down this thing with physiological needs and security needs and social needs and esteem needs and self-actualization, a lot of executives realized, wait a minute, you know, Maslow broke that pyramid down and he said, down here are the belly needs of people, security, food, and so on. And up here are their brain needs. And executives realized that their compensation systems, their reward systems, were all predicated on the traditional old idea that slaves need to be fed and are concerned about security and so on. So it was in the 40s where Maslow's influence became very dramatic in management, simply because he spoke the kind of English that most business executives can understand. And we realized for the first time that our workers are up here. Our employees are concerned about esteem and dignity and ego and self-actualization, as well as a good salary and good office conditions and so on. Excuse me, Dr. Leibovitz, that's Maslow. But what other important theories need to be considered? In 1952, Fred Hertzberg came along, professor at Case Western, and did a very interesting study, which today is used as the basis for a lot of managerial techniques such as quality circles that Hertzberg built on Maslow. He interviewed 300 accountants and engineers and said, what do you like about your job? Actually, he said, think of an incident at work that gives you job satisfaction. He categorized their responses, and he discovered that, much like Maslow, engineers said and accountants said what they liked about their work were achievement, recognition, advancement, the work itself, solving a difficult equation. Well, that all made their heads feel better. When they asked in 1952, what turns you off? What bugs you? What makes you go home and kick the dog? They said lousy working conditions, bad bosses, routine, boredom, and monotony. That sounded a lot like Maslow's belly needs. And so what, what Hertzberg said was, hey, folks, just like Maslow, people are motivated to meet their brain needs today at work. Their belly needs he called hygiene factors. Now, he borrowed the term from, from uh, medicine. Hygiene does not guarantee that you have good health. Hygiene just means you don't pick up a lot of crud. What he's saying was, if you take care of boredom, routine, bad bosses, and pay, the hygiene factors, that you don't end up with necessarily motivated people. You just end up with a lot of people who aren't complaining about the work conditions, the pay, and so on. But if you really want motivation, you've got to provide an environment for people that permits them to meet their needs for dignity, esteem, involvement, and so on. Now, that is fundamental to the concept of participative management. Okay, that's what theories tell us about workers. But let me ask you, Don, out in the real world, how do you implement those theories? And let's start with Maslow's hierarchy. Uh, again, different people will come to as in a work setting or a personal setting at a different place on that hierarchy. Uh, so I attempt to use that by learning about people, observing their behavior, and trying to see how I can facilitate meeting their needs and the organization's needs. Uh, Hertzberg is more situational, uh, the environment. Uh, he makes an excellent point about the, uh, the theory that there are certain aspects of the organization, the, the uh, uh, climate, if you will, that will can inhibit uh, a person's need to do the job. Uh, he also makes an excellent point that the work itself, recognition, achievement are the, are the true motivators. So what I do organizationally is we make sure that our maintenance needs, if you will, are, uh, are in good shape. We, uh, you see here, we have a, a reasonably nice place to work. It's attractive, uh, air conditioned. Uh, uh, there are things, we subsidize the drink machine. That's a maintenance issue, that they get 10 cent drinks here. Uh, that's part of what I learned in understanding uh, Hertzberg's theory. And then on the motivating side, uh, exact responsibilities and turn, them, turn the people loose. Dr. Leibovitz, from what Don and, and you have told us, it's plain to see that to create the right environment, managers have to assume a leadership role. In that regard, what is leadership? I did my doctoral work with one of the grand men in leadership theory, Ralph Stogdell at Ohio State. He was the foremost authority at the time, I think it still is, on, on leadership phenomena. 
I went to, I left the Air Force, went to graduate school, and went to study with him because I was fascinated with the idea of leadership and I wanted to learn more about it. So I knelt at his feet and I said, I'm a brand new doctoral student. I've got three years for you to tell me what leadership is all about. And he looked down at me and he said, my son, he said, leadership is the process of influencing an organized group in its efforts towards goal setting and goal achievement. And I remember thinking, what? With this, I, I'm going to spend three years. And then it took three years for him to understand what he was talking about. Leadership is a process of influence. It's a verb. It's not a noun. It's an ongoing phenomenon that takes place in groups. It's something that groups give to people. You say leadership is a process of influencing people. If all people are different, which we've said earlier, are there then different styles of leadership? Historically, classically, it's always been autocratic. Because if you've got slaves building a pyramid who don't want to be there, you make the assumption that the only way to motivate them is with a whip. And that assumption, historically, was quite accurate. So autocratic management has its roots buried in history. Sometime, if you're ever in a group with a group of, of ex-military people, ask the enlisted men the following question, and because they're all graduates of the classic autocratic school of management from their, their military days. If it moves, and they'll say, salute it. If it doesn't, and they'll say, paint it. Somebody taught them that very early in an autocratic environment. <laughs> Just shut up and do what we tell you. The brains of the outfit are in the head shed. Jump, and I'll tell you how hot. That's autocratic management. Now, there are other ways of managing that have evolved over the years. And one of the foremost, and perhaps one of the most important, I think, is participative management. It's managing with your people as distinct from managing your people. There's another form of management, which sometimes participative management is mistaken for, incorrectly. It's called laissez-faire management. Don Lawhorn, can you tell us how you use those autocratic, participative, and laissez-faire or free-range styles of leadership? That's uh, a good question, Alex, and I, I look forward to answering that one because I get to use all three of those at different times. I think principally in our business, it's a participative style, and that's a reflection of the situation and the people in that situation. Uh, we must remember there will be those people who we may have in a, in a professional relationship who want a style of leadership, whether that be participative, free reign, or authoritarian. So uh, we use all three here. Uh, the Democratic one every Thursday. We have a small staff meeting, and, and, and whatever we're going to have for lunch is a, is, is a Democratic process. Uh, hours of work to some degree. We want coverage here from 7.30 to 5.30. I allow or provide the opportunity for the salespeople to work out between and among themselves who's going to work what hours. So that's strictly up to them. And then there are some things that uh, are more uh, authoritarian in nature. There are certain requirements uh, uh, in, in each job that are best addressed through a, a gentle nudge, if you will. And quite frankly, if necessary, a, a, a firm nudge. Do it or... Uh, or we're going to have to uh, evaluate why you're not doing it. So, when do you use laissez-faire or free-range style? I think that's used by myself on a regular basis. Uh, there's a lot of decisions that are going on each day and that, that, that you leave the, the freedom to do that to the people. So I think that that particular uh, style of leadership exists often. Uh, I go to a lot of meetings. I'm, I'm out of the building quite a bit. And uh, I think the professionals that we have at all levels, from the highest to the lowest, they, they know that's, that they've got a job to do and I expect them to do it. And that's, that's free reign to me. As a final question, I'd like to turn to you, Dr. Leibovitz, and ask you, if there is a general statement we can make about which style of leadership is best? Yes, there is a general statement you can make. It depends. One of the things you find is it is impossible to categorize a person, a manager, simply by taking his or her picture. If you take a snapshot of somebody yelling at somebody, take that hill, you may indicate that this, you may think that's an autocratic manager. And somebody smiling and meeting in a group is a participative manager. But I often remind people, for every hundred second lieutenants who yell, take that hill, 50 get shot in the back and 50 get followed. <laughs> So that if you stand back from management and view it as a dynamic process, most good managers blend their styles to make it consistent with a particular, a particular situation.
So in conclusion, we can say that a good manager is a leader who uses a style to fit the moment. All right. I want to thank you, Don Lawhorn in Dallas, for being with us. Well, Alex, thank you. I'm glad that uh, we could be a part of this program. Dr. Leibovitz, I won't say goodbye to you just yet because you have agreed to stand by and help me wrap up the show. Right now, though, we are going out to the West Coast to visit a company that has put a lot of things we've been talking about into action. The name of that company is Tandem Computers Incorporated, a supplier of computer systems and networks. And this is Tandem's headquarters in Cupertino, California. The work environment here has been developed with an understanding that individuals have unique talents and needs and that management plays the key role in recognizing and supporting people. There is an underlying philosophy in the company that says that individuals hired to do a job are to be treated as responsible adults. For example, Tandem practices self-management. There are no time clocks to punch. Instead, flexible work hours are determined by the workers themselves. Together, they decide when the group will come to work and when they will leave. The environment has been created to help individuals make the best use of their time, talents, and skills. People are encouraged to have a real stake in what goes on at Tandem and to contribute to its success, and the desire to participate is strong. That is evident in spontaneous work discussions on the shop floor, group planning and targeted results in the workplace. People here show pride of ownership, a feeling originated by workers and supported by managers. Workers have accepted their responsibility to help keep communications open. They develop and publish work group bulletins, which address issues such as quality problems, results, and solutions. Based on a belief that the workplace should be more like home, there are no badges or corporate boards with names and titles on them. People are viewed as equal contributors. And facilities have been designed to accommodate the multiple interests of all employees. Over. The needs of families, single parent families, and single adults are all provided for. And that includes the very human need to get away. In addition to regular vacations, employees are also given six week sabbaticals after four years employment. We're going to try to do uh, a total of about 180 processors a quarter. Team meetings, in essence, quality control circles, have been installed by management, but the format and the meetings themselves are run by teams of management and labor. These meetings are intended to give workers who know the problems the opportunity to express feelings and shorten the communication line between everyone involved. The idea is to recognize problems and fix them faster. This concern with keeping the lines of communications open and honest is one of the critical support elements management has fostered in the work setting. In fact, communication is seen as a necessary ingredient if people are to become more responsible. Everybody come up on BTR 1 and just all the two. Management at Tandem is so convinced of that, they have invested in a company TV network. The network enables top management to beam itself into all company plants and offices in Canada and the United States. This is a good, this is a good process for the company. Don't say great. The purpose is a series of interactive Tandem talks. Top managers discuss products and operations on the air, and people watching can ask any questions they want. The results of Tandem's philosophy is an environment which is conducive to work, openness, trust, and a feeling of partnership. All right, let's meet the man most responsible for the work environment at Tandem Corporation. He is the CEO and chairman of the board of the company, Jim Twybig. It's a pleasure to have you here, Alex. After a look at your headquarters there, it's easy to see why you're known for a motivated workforce, Jim. I'd like to know how you created this work environment. Everything starts with the manager, and that's the most important thing. If a manager doesn't care about people, it doesn't matter whether the door is open or not, because people are never walked through the door. So. So the essence of everything we do is try to ensure that we only have managers that are outstanding managers, but they must also care about people. And I think 
that's a hard thing to do. We don't have secrets on that. If the manager is the starting point, what else is key? The thing we've really done at Tandem, I think, perhaps more than other companies, is try to institutionalize. For instance, in the hiring process, we demand that all people be honest, that they care about people, that they want to work together, and we teach that to every single person. So we institutionalize the hiring process because that's kind of like the blood of a company. So you hire the right people and they create the positive environment. Could you tell us something about your philosophy behind this? Well, to talk about the philosophy would take a long time, but I think the essence of the philosophy and what we're trying to accomplish at Tanum is that there's a need, if you look into the future, for productivity and creativity to be successful. And so what we're trying to do is shift the responsibility, shift the responsibility, for instance, of self-management to individuals and to give them the tools to do that, and also to let them participate in the success of Tandem, and to shift the role of management in a classical sense to creativity, to strategy, to product direction, to caring about people. We'd like to spend more time, but unfortunately we're going to have to close right there, Jim. Thanks very much for this look at Tandem. It's been valuable. Thank you, Alex. We're going back across the country now to Boston and Dr. George Leibovitz. Dr. Leibovitz, thank you for staying with us. Just a few final questions. One point made by Tandem Computers, as you saw, was the importance of recognizing the intelligence and abilities of workers and also encouraging them to participate in decisions. What's the importance of participation and delegation in creating a work environment? Participative management and delegation are, are intertwined with each other. You can't do one without the other. Participative management is predicated in the idea that people who work for you are smarter than you are. It's a, it's a terrible thing for American executives to overcome. That it is okay to manage people who are smarter than you are. That technology makes people smart. And participative techniques help bring these smart people into the decision-making process with you so you, the boss, can make better decisions. The reason that one wants to use any kind of participative technique that permits people to influence the design of systems that affect them isn't to manipulate the employee. It's to save the butt of the boss, to make the boss do well so he can make or she can make better decisions by taking advantage of all these consultants who work, who work with them. I'm a, I'm a consultant. I spend my living going into organizations, talking to people, asking two questions. What consultants do is they'll go into a hospital or a business or any kind of organization that's having problems and ask everybody who'll talk to us two questions. What's wrong with this office, this plant, this hospital, this floor? And the people we talk to tell us time and time again. Then we ask another critical question in management consulting. How do you think you can fix what's wrong? And they tell us that also. Then we rush out, come back to our offices, type it up, we have very expensive covers we put the stuff into, ship it back to management, along with the bill. Participative management recognizes that you can eliminate the third party in this process. You can take advantage, you can work with the experts, the consultants who are already on your payroll. Participative management presupposes that to, the way you develop decision makers and talent in organizations is to let them make decisions. So the whole object in modern management is, is to how do you push decision-making down and responsibility down where the action is so that people who are out there in the front lines can make the best kind of decision. The charge of the light brigade was ordered by somebody who didn't know the territory. So delegation is the greatest compliment you can pay to an employee. What you're really saying when you delegate is go forth now and make the decisions you've got to make to do your job. And if you screw up, my butt is on the line too. But I got more important things to worry about. So the process of doing that, letting that person have broader decision-making power, working with you and having input to you, develops that person as a decision-maker. Dr. Levitz, something else we saw at Tandem were team meetings that focus on quality. Now, how do these quality circles improve the work environment? Quality circles is another participative management technique. Essentially, it's a group of workers asking themselves the two questions of management consulting. Only they're going to do it every week. And they're going to sit down every week and ask themselves, how can we put the left front wheel of a Ford on better as it goes by? They'll be taught and they'll use some fairly sophisticated problem solving and statistical techniques. But 
more than anything else, it is a participative process. We're talking about letting employees on a production line who know more about putting the wheels on than we do influence how those wheels are going to be put on. One thing we haven't discussed is management by objectives. How does MBO relate to participation? Management by objectives is a participative process of management. It was first designed or defined by Peter Drucker, well-known management theorist in 1954, in his book, The Practice of Management. Drucker argued that organizations function better if they're, if they're focused. If there's a major, clear objective that the whole organization is going to focus on. Indeed, the job of senior management is to define the strategy of the organization and what we have to do. And the object now becomes, well, how are we going to get there? breaking the work up in an ongoing cascading process so that if we have this major task to perform, we break it into chunks, like building a pyramid. And the person in charge of slaves now has a timeline. If we're going to achieve so many pyramids by next year, what do I have to have by the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter? And if that's my responsibility, the people who work for me now have responsibilities too. How am I going to build the west end of the pyramid versus the north end and the south end and so on? And then the person on the west end is warning, boy, how am I going to get section B to do that by the end of the first quarter? So if everybody writes down their bit or, or contributing bit to the whole, then the whole thing ought to arrive at the end of the year. Managing by objectives is a very sound way of management. One final question. This is about jobs themselves. How can they be redesigned to improve the workplace? One way that jobs can be redesigned to improve the workplace is through job enrichment. Now that goes back to Hertzberg, who we talked about before. There's a difference between job enlargement and job enrichment. Job enlargement is simply a matter of adding more tasks to people, saying, shut up and do what I tell you again and again and again, as distinct from job enrichment. And one of the points that Hertzberg made during his research was that enrichment means putting things into a job that meet the higher level needs of folks for challenge, for creativity, for responsibility, and so on that there's a lot that management can do to push that down on individuals. In the final analysis, I suppose, that's a good way to say that's what creating a positive work environment is all about. Dr. Leibovitz, thank you. We have covered a lot of ground in the past half hour, and I have enjoyed it very much. So have I. Thank you. I'm Alex Burton, and this has been The Business File. The preceding program is part of a college credit course.